Welcome, everyone. It's so nice to see everyone today. Uh, we have had quite a few people sign up for this session, so we will spend a little bit of time on introductions to give folks a chance to join in. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, which is fantastic for those I haven't met. I'm Sky Cornell, the Director of Consulting at Social, Social Venture Partners Connecticut, and I've been working with several other SVP partners, several of whom you'll meet today on our early childhood efforts. And I'm just about to share our screen. But before I do that, a little bit of an introduction on the last few years. Um, as many of you know, and several people here actually participated in, in Social Venture Partners uh, 2020 strategic plan efforts. areas that we look at when we think about. There we go, got that fixed. Uh, we committed to early childhood care and education as one of our core strategies in addressing and closing the opportunity gap in Connecticut. So this has meant a lot of um, new work for SVP, new efforts in the last uh, 12 to 18 months, uh, new projects, which we're excited to share about, um, building partnerships and relationships in early childhood care and education, uh, a lot of learning. We very much um, consider ourselves to be continuing to learn and emerging you know, in this space. And it means having sessions like the one that we're having today, where we will be sharing more about the sector, the opportunities and the challenges um, that, we, that we face in early childhood care and education in Connecticut. And um, really trying to figure out ways to engage more SVP partners, which it's been exciting to see that grow in the last you know, 12 to 18 months. And thank you, Camille just made a reminder to ask folks to go on mute if you're not speaking, thank you. Uh, so we're going to get started in just a moment. We have a lot of familiar faces, social SVP partners. I am thrilled to say that when we looked at the sign up for this session, we had quite a few of our other um, partners and, and folks who we've been building relationships with in this area. Um, a few I'll point out today because we have people on the call who could very much give um, this overview of the sector in their sleep. And we have people from um, Children's Learning Centers of Fairfield County, thrilled to have you here, uh, experts in the field. We have um, potentially, I saw that Dr. Monette Ferguson might be joining us, another uh, leader of an incredible center in Bridgeport. We also have a few folks from the Early Childhood Funder Collaborative, which is where we've been really thrilled to have some uh, great partnerships and get to know and learn folks in that space. Um, I see Sarah is here and uh, co-lead uh, Kim Russo is here as well. So thank you so much for joining us. We are going to have some time at the end for Q&A and I hope that we might be able to um, have you speak as well on, on some of the questions because I know that many in this group would love to hear from you. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Mary Yench. Mary is one of our SVP partners who has been part of the Early Childhood Care and Education team. Uh, Mary is also one of the uh, partners who've been providing technical assistance on an advocacy coalition we've been supporting as well as a lead on our Clifford Beers projects. So Mary's wearing a lot of hats. Thank you for providing the overview on this uh, ecosystem today. And I will just start to share my slides here, if you'll just give me a moment to do that. And we'll get started. It always takes a minute longer than I'd like for it to take. Okay, can everyone see my slides? Can I see a thumbs up if people can see the slide? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so Mary will speak on the ecosystem and then we will speak a little bit about the SVP projects. And finally, we'll be joined by uh, Ava Bermuda Zimmerman to speak about the Campaign for Child Care for Connecticut. Mary, I will turn it over to you. Terrific. Um, so I just want to do a, a footnote at the front end of this. Um, the goal of this is not to give 
to suggest that we actually know um, or to pretend to give you know, a huge in-depth overview of the sector of early child care. Um, what we really want to do is put create a context so that when um, Jen Gerber and Sky start to talk about some of the projects we've invested in, that there'll be at least a context for those of us that are a little less familiar with this space. And my apologies to some of our visitors who are far more capable of giving this presentation. Um, and I hope that you will bear with the fact that the goal is not to pretend we know everything, it's really just to create a context for the rest of the conversation. So with that caveat in mind, um, let's start with why. Why did SVP as a part of the strategic planning process identify early child care and education as a space we wanted to spend more time investing, partner time and energy and investing? So first of all, um, the, the overall mission of SVP is to help close the opportunity gap. That's, if you go to the SVP site, that's part of our mission. And what we realized with a lot of research sort of in the last 18 months is that early child care and education um, is a huge contributor to the opportunity of closing that gap. It's an important equity issue, which is one of our, our strategic pillars. Um, because if you enter kindergarten um, not ready, which is really much more prevalent with children of color and children from low income backgrounds, um, the projected trajectory that you would have to have to catch up with your peers over the course of your education is almost inhuman. Science shows research and brain research in the past several years has shown that 90% of our brain development occurs in the first five years of our lives. Um, and yet, when you look at how much we invest as a society, um, as a state, um, in our communities, um, in those children, um, it's, I mean, we're just way behind. Uh, we invest about 30 times more each year in K through 12 than we do in early childcare and education. Um, and as we know, because we don't invest in those first five years, we're over investing in K-12 and we still can't help the children who are not prepared to catch up. Um, the flip side of this is that there's a lot of good research that shows that when you do invest in high quality childcare, early childcare, it generates a very high social return on investment. Um, some um, sources quote up to 13%. Um, and this doesn't only benefit the children, it benefits their families because it enables mothers and fathers to participate fully in the, in the workforce. And we're gonna come back to that in a few minutes because as we all know, in the past two years, we're very clear on how critical good childcare and education is to enable families to work. Um, the good news, and we'll spend a little more time on that in a few minutes, is that actually Connecticut, as frustrating as it can seem, has a very strong foundation to build on. Um, so we're not starting way behind in the pack. Um, and from SVP's perspective, one of the reasons we invested and focused is because we have, um, through the Governor's Workforce Council, through many of the other initiatives, some really good relationships with key folks in this space, key institutions, key people that we're investing in building relationships with. Sky, if you go to the next one. Yellow. Yeah, and I'll just ask folks if you're not speaking to go on mute. Thank you. So the other reason this is a really important time to be focused on this, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, it's it's really a historic moment for many people in this space. It's just, it seems like such an opportunity. Um, on one hand, um, there's lots of conversation and hopefully good outcome that the federal government and the state government are willing to invest significant amounts of money. Early child care is, I'm sure many of you begin to notice both with the ads and the, and the PR it, in the um, proposed infrastructure bill is a, is a significant amount of money to go towards early child care. 
And sort of early in the game, initial estimates were that Connecticut might receive even as much as $450 million each year over the 10 years. Um, that's probably not going to be where we, it ends up, but the, the, the point is, is that there's the opportunity to have significantly more funding to make significant changes. I mentioned already the pandemic has really highlighted how essential and critical this system is. Um, and, and when it's not working, which it really hasn't been working very well in the past two years in particular, um, it has huge impact for all of us, not just families with children. Sky, if we can go to the next one. So those are really sort of the reasons why we got involved um, and it became a strategic initiative. Um, so let's just, for those of us that are less familiar, do sort of a very high level, you know, what are the challenges in this space? Um, and so we were talking about this and, and I think it was Michael who, who offered a, a joke, okay? So you can fit, and I'm not a very great joke teller, but uh, basically this is sort of like the, the senior sitting in a diner and you can make them any ethnic or, or cultural one you want, but senior sitting in a diner, scarfing down their early suppers in Florida saying, complaining that the food isn't very good and more importantly, there isn't enough of it. And that's sort of where early childcare is, is um, much of it is not very good. And of the not, not very good, there actually isn't enough of it. So, um, you know, there is shortage of spaces. We're gonna talk about that in a few minutes. Um, the, the funding is very uneven. The state of Connecticut tends to fund by town um, and there hasn't been much federal funding and the the COVID funding is not permanent, so the, the system participants cannot count on it going on forever. Um, state funding has been very low in this space because they've invested more in K through 12. And even though we have an Office of, Econ of Early Child Care in the state, their resources have also been fairly restricted. There really isn't a system, uh, there is a system, but it's not a very organized or structured system. Um, there are many, many different funding streams, types of providers, reflecting in part parents' preferences. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Importantly, not only are there not enough spaces, but the, the early child care workforce is underpaid, undertrained, um, high turnover, really undervalued um, by all the rest of us when they really are critical to the development of the next generation. Um, and last but not least, there is an estimate that the state of Connecticut is missing up to 50,000 spaces. That means there are children whose parents want to send them to early child care and education and there is no available program. Um, that they can get their children in. And often that's a function of both quality and um, money. So Sky, let's, let's do the next one. So we wanted to give you just sort of a very simple overview of all of the players in the system, which adds to the complexity as people are looking at new ways of structuring this system and ways of funding this system. Um, so at the core are children and families, needless to say, and we've got infants and toddlers. So often people look at programs for three to five for kindergarten readiness, but families have needs for children that are younger than three years old. And so that tends to be a divide in terms of the kinds of services and programs that are offered. Um, providers, this is a very complicated space. Um, in part, a reflection of parents' desires for very different kinds of experiences for their children. Some people need full-time, some people need part-time, some people want home-based, some people want center-based, some people want religious site-based, um, some want their families and grandparents. Um, so people are looking for very different solutions. Um, Sort of the next ring out are all the services and supporting organizations that operate in the system to support the providers and the families. You have state agencies, you have local councils and networks, and you have all kinds of wraparound services, particularly for children 
of color and low income households. Um, finally, you have another whole set of stakeholders who at the moment are pretty you know, energized and active, which is not to say they haven't been historically, but there are new opportunities. So you have advocates, you have philanthropic groups, um, uh, you have employers who, because of the last two years, seem to be much more engaged in the conversation or at least interested in having the conversation. Um, and last but not least, you have collective impact groups. So while we made this really nice bullseye, we've tried several times to draw like a network system and it really looks like the back of my needle point, terrible. Um, so, so don't let this simple graphic suggest that it's this simple. Um, but again, for the purposes of today, it seemed the easiest way to convey sort of the, the breadth of the types of stakeholders involved. Okay, Sky, let's do the next one. Today, we wanted just to spend a few minutes on two of those stakeholders. Um, again, to give you some perspective on and context for where we've made um, investments. So let's start with the families. So the first thing we know is that there aren't enough spaces statewide. Importantly, there are often not enough accessible spaces. And that's a function of cost, transportation. If I'm working uh, the overnight shift, there probably aren't programs for my children. Um, there's just a lot of reasons why even the available spaces may or may not well meet the family's needs. There are many different funding streams and subsidies in the state, and that makes it a very challenging space to navigate for low-income families trying to get to subsidies. For middle-income families, it's a huge economic impact. Um, there's, you know, they can pay as much for childcare as it costs for a year's tuition at UConn. And for many families with multiple children under the age of five, that's a huge burden to bear, even though they quote unquote are middle income. And even families who perhaps are not income challenged, the real challenge is finding quality programs. Again, if you go back to providers who are underpaid, <laughs> undertrained, finding enough spaces in good quality programs can be a real challenge for all families. So this is, you know, what we we tend, particularly SVP, to focus on families um, of need. The truth is, is the system isn't working well for any, many families. Um, and quality is a huge issue. Again, even establishing what that means. Is that kindergarten ready? Uh, is it emotional and, and physical health and well-being? Like, what are sort of the markers of what we would even consider a quality? Um, and I know that the state of Connecticut is looking at some of those, and at least QIS is mentioned on the slide. Okay, Sky, let's do um, the next one. So the, the flip of this is providers. Um, takes two to tango. <laughs> Families need providers and providers need a whole lot of support and help and real change in how they participate in this system. Um, again, there isn't a one size fits all for families. It's a real quilt of very, very different kinds of providers and experiences that children want, that families want for their children. This is often very true of children of uh, parents of color um, and Hispanics who want sort of cultural validity. They want their children to be in places where they're part of the community, often family members. Um, all that said, all the providers have the same challenges. Most are not making a living wage. Um, there is um, research that shows that particularly uh, people of color, primarily women, um, providing have to have subsidies of some other kind to survive. So even though they're working and providing an incredibly essential service, they can't live on the wages they're being paid. Um, because of that, there's not significant training. These women can't afford the training. Um, even if you get trained, you're going to come into a space that you don't earn enough money to survive. 
So even though there are programs and there are uh, women graduating with them, it's very difficult to translate that into a livable experience. And then as we've talked about, because of this, there aren't enough providers um, and there aren't enough spaces. Okay, so we've talked a lot about sort of the challenges and the problems. I'd like to spend just a few minutes before I end talking a little bit about some of the advantages that Connecticut starts with, because I think that's a positive reason for spending our time and energies and monies in this space. So the good news, even though the food is bad and there's not enough of it, is that Connecticut actually rates as one of the 12 highest systems working effectively. I, I don't wanna dwell on what that means for the other 36 or 38, if I do my math right. Um, but the good news for those of us living in Connecticut is there's a lot of assets, a lot of strengths. Many of the, the visitors on the screen today are involved in efforts and, um, and have been for a long time. Uh, to really create strengths and foundations for the early child care system that exists today. Um, as a state, we have an office of early child care that not all states do. Um, at, at the moment, the governor has a significant commitment to this space. Um, the good news, serendipitously, is that a lot of the foundational work that is being done in Connecticut appears to be aligned with sort of the early insights into the federal guidelines for funding. So that's one of the reasons Connecticut is optimistic about getting funding um, when the infrastructure is um, approved. Um, there's been a long established early childhood funders collaborative. They've been investing consistently in trying to improve the system. So there are lots of people, that's why I sort of apologize up front. SVP is sort of new to this space. There are lots of people that have been investing for a long time in making the system better and they have been successful. Um, not as successful as they would like to be and, 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 and there's just lots of opportunity. Um, net net, and then I'll stop. And if you want to ask a few, are we going to ask questions now, Sky, or at the end? Um, I think we're going to hold till the end. But if folks have questions okay. put into the chat, that would be great because then we can see if we can address throughout. Right. So just net net sort of the context is it's a really important system, early child care and education. Um, and it needs to be improved. The good news is we start with many strengths and assets in Connecticut. And from an SVP perspective, we have this fabulous opportunity to partner with many advocates and influencers to sort of collaborative work together to create a system um, that works better, the, the change that needs to happen. So that's the context. And now I'm going to hand it over to Sky and to Jen uh, to talk a little bit about what we, in fact, are actually doing at the moment. Thank you so much, Mary. And it looks like we might have a few questions coming in. We really appreciate you sharing about uh, the ecosystem. I'm going to turn it uh, right over to Jen Gerber. Uh, for those who have been part of SVP's work over the last 18 months in this area, you've definitely been working with Jen. Jen is one of our um, sector team co-leads along with Rob Wexler and where so many uh, in, incredibly important hats at SVP, including acting as a board member and um, leading some of the efforts you'll see today and still finds time to also lead a, the Domus project. So thank you, Jen. I will turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Sky, um, And thank you, Mary, for providing uh, this context. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, today. Um, I'm going to start with sort of where um, we SVP are in this work and just to echo what you've been hearing repeatedly. Um, we want to emphasize with humility that we are just starting out here. Um, we're in the early stages of our work um, in early childhood. Um, prior to this year, we had done work in the, in the space, um, for example, with um, All Our Kin and also the Governor's Workforce Council. But this is really our first year, our first full year with multiple projects in ECE. And we're really excited about these projects and, and want to be able to tell you a little bit about them um, uh, shortly. But I also want to emphasize again that, that 
we've been trying to build relationships and knowledge and, and understanding um, throughout the past year, and we'll be continuing to do so and, and trying to deepen um, relationships that we've we've been trying to form with some of the strong organizations in this space to help elevate their work. And those organizations include the Office of Early Childhood, the Funders Collaborative, and others. The focus of SVP's projects right now in ECE are around capacity building of individual organizations, systems change, and also alignment, alignment of different efforts um, in this complex space that Mary just described. Um, we're really grateful because we are being invited to participate in a variety of important projects and important opportunities. Um, so what follows now is going to be a little description of our current um, projects. Um, next slide, um, please. So um, our, our first project um, we want to uh, describe is New Haven is with New Haven uh, Child. New Haven Child proposes to transform the early care and education landscape in New Haven, Connecticut by bringing the community together around a common vision of ideal learning. This places the child at the center of learning. And to achieve ideal learning for all children ages zero through eight New Haven, New Haven Child focuses on two key pathways, access and quality. The objectives of this capacity building project for SVP are twofold, to develop a communications plan that helps to elevate New Haven Child and to help New Haven Child in fundraising. I'm not gonna um, read out the names of the teams um, on these slides, but you can see um, that we have um, robust teams involved in all of these projects. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the next project um, reflects the strategic par partnership that um, uh, SVP has with the management consultant M McKinsey, in which McKinsey contributes their own consulting teams to SVP projects. One of these is for the Office of Early Childhood. The OEC has some funds earmarked for facilities infrastructure investment and with a potential of significant additional federal funds for building out supply, the OEC really needs a plan that is centered on equity to help prioritize the allocation of these funds, as well as to identify um, funding vehicles and strategies for distribution. So the McKinsey team and SVP are helping to develop an infrastructure investment plan. Next slide, please. Bridgeport Prospers is a United Way cradle to career in collective impact effort. Their baby bundle zero to three work has attracted the attention of national funders. In this project, we are first supporting the baby bundle marketing needs and honing in on approaches to build public awareness with moms and families, as well as ways to improve the awareness and consistency of communications among direct service providers. Once we have some traction on that piece of work, we'll start to work on their investment portfolio, starting with some financial modeling. Next slide, please. We are also um, providing some technical assistance for a new advocacy initiative here in Connecticut. I will save discussion of this for our guest speaker who will be joining us in a moment. But before pivoting to that, I do wanna mention one other project that SVP has been invited to work on. We are helping the Office of Early Childhood in building a comprehensive strategic plan for early care and education. The objective is to build a plan to develop and fund an accessible, affordable, high quality, equitable, and sustainable child care system that works for families. This is expected to build on the pillars of the OEC long-term vision, which include equity, access, provider stability, and investments in ECE workforce, community voice, and quality outcomes. It also will build on learnings from prior work that the OEC um, has done. This project has not um, officially started yet. The OEC is expected to have a lot of resources in this important effort in addition to SVP. And SVP's role is likely to include things like helping to structure project planning, supporting tracking and alignment of different efforts um, and work groups, and providing additional project capacity as needed. With that said, Sky, I will turn it back to you. All right, thank you, Jen. And I think you you caught us you caught us up. So <laughs> exciting to be uh, right where we thought we would be time wise. I think that means we'll have some time for some good conversation at the end. Uh, welcome. I see a few more folks have have joined us since we we all came back together. And um, with that, I'm excited to turn this over in just a minute to um, Ava Bermudez Zimmerman. Uh, 
Ava, I can see that you are on the screen here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Hello. There you are. Hey, Ava. Okay. I will share our the slides in, in just a minute that, that we prepared. Uh, but the, the bridge here is um, one of the projects that Jen mentioned, and thank you again, Jen. One of the projects that, that Jen mentioned was the Child Care for Connecticut campaign. Um, thrilled that Ava Bermuda Zimmerman is one of the co-leads, truly an inspiring co-lead of that effort. And um, SVP had, was introduced to this effort through the Early Childhood Funder Collaborative earlier this year. And it's been pretty amazing to get to know this diverse group of stakeholders. Um, we've had a small SVP team, as you saw, uh, Mary and Rob Wexler, both um, and myself all supporting and providing technical assistance to this group. It's really, um, it's been a joy. Eva has um, some exciting things to share, including the, the public launch of the campaign coming up in November. So with that, I will share my slides again. Just a moment here. Okay, let me just, oh, give me just a minute. Sorry, I'm gonna have to go through all of these again. There we go. And as you can see um, in her work with SEIU Local 2001, uh, Ava represents nearly 4,000 providers, um, family care providers and 300 center-based staff. So I'll turn that over to you, Ava. Hello, everyone, and thank you, SCB, for having me on. Uh, the EC community is very fortunate to have uh, such a powerful and well-versed player in, in this conversation that is often overlooked. Um, most of you on this call know that the early child community, as mentioned on this uh, presentation today, has a spotlight on them because of the pandemic, and this gives ample opportunity to think things differently and create something that is fortified for the future. Uh, with that in, in our reality, a lot of our, many of you on the call now, a lot of our coalition partners who have known each other, collaborated in the past with other early education initiatives came together and early pandemic realized we have to do more. We have to look into some sustainable funding that doesn't just fix or put a Band-Aid during this crisis, but again, it's in the word, sustainable. Long-term allows for opportunity for parents and family members to rethink how they're caring for children and how they're funding for child care for children. Um, when we created this coalition group, I have to say we were ahead of our time. Uh, it was prior to Biden or any uh, legislative entity discussing long-term uh, infrastructure. And we were already trying to plan what a campaign and a coalition would look like uh, for the sustainable funding. Now it's hot to trot, you know, the conversation is a buzzword and that's great. But in the planning for something long-term, we understand those in the early education and childcare community know that things are fads. You know, it's, it's a hot topic now, but easily a year from now, sadly, people can forget that this is still a crisis. They can forget that in the early childhood community, parents still need help paying for childcare, that providers are not getting paid enough. Uh, a lot of providers might be making that dollar, two dollars more an hour, but probably still have a lot of student debt that they've incurred and they can't even afford to pay it off. So in this longer conversation, we want to highlight as a coalition uh, that there's multiple ways to try to fix this and reimagine what childcare looked like. And we want to make sure that it's in the forefront of everyone's mind in year one, two, three, four, five, depending on how long it, it takes to fix um, and create practical solutions. In this campaign, the Reimagine Coalition or Connecticut um, Child Care Campaign, uh, we're looking into, like I said, building infrastructure. That infrastructure is public policy. That means that the expectation is legislative, the legislative body within uh, our state capital here in Connecticut is not depending on just federal funding to fix it for them. If the Biden administration 
is fortunate enough uh, to convince legislators on the federal level to make those adjustments, wonderful. We have more uh, financial footing to play with and creating infrastructure here in Connecticut. But we know it's tandem. One needs the other in order to have successful solutions. So the campaign is looking into local um, local advocacy, local legislators to restructure how we're doing things here in Connecticut. We're looking in that restructuring to find sustainable growth for childcare where all children have access to early education. We're looking to make sure providers, early ed providers in centers, home-based care, uh, private or subsidized pay get paid a, an, you know, a livable wage, that they're getting compensated adequately. And we're also looking to make sure that in this conversation, equity is highlighted. Um, just uh, recently in the PowerPoint presentation, Mary made mention about the uh, impact of children when it comes to people of color. That is no different when it comes to the educators as well. So not only do we have a lot of families of color who are left out of this conversation, but we also have providers who are left out of the conversation. When we're talking about policy changes and we're looking at an equity lens, it comes from both sides and making sure that inclusion is realistic for those providing care and those asking for care. So going to the campaign, I know that many of you have probably some connection or conversation to an early ed group. How can you not, right? This is why you're here. And SVP is highlighting the need to have more players in the conversation. But I'm excited to say that in this new coalition that we're building, we're gonna be formally launching uh, on November 3rd, Wednesday, November 3rd. And this launch, as you can see on the slide before you, we're gonna have the conversation of everyone being under this tent. So we're asking those broad partners, our nonprofits, our advocacy leaders, our uh, politicians, our parents, and our family members and providers to come along this campaign and let's make sure that we transform how early education looks like in Connecticut. The expectation is taking pro previous campaigns of large scale here in the state of Connecticut. We've so far created a strategic plan and a mission statement built on what other nonprofits and organizations have learned from previous campaigns. And we can try to make sure that that broad tent doesn't X out any voices. So by allowing to have those voices integrated to our coalition, it also allows us to funnel public policy in a way that actually impacts people. I know that I'm saying a lot of words that sound buzzy, but to break it down even further and, and get out of the, the normal nonprofit speech here, what it comes down to is a lot of pu public policy campaigns say that they're going to listen to people, but unfortunately don't. And I'm not going to name names. I just want to point out that when you're trying to change law, often and I'm, if, you're, if you're in this um, role as an advocate, you probably understand this, that often you say, share your stories to a community member or community leader. You say, let's testify and make sure legislators really understand what's happening here. And once that testimony is heard, once that story is shared, you move on and you go into the brass tacks, you go into the legal end, but you forget the story. And what we would like to do differently in this coalition is to make sure that we don't forget the story, that the story actually leads to parent, parent involvement and provider engagement who are leading the campaign and the struggle. Why is that so important? Well, unlike other public policy reforms, when you're trying to build something large scale, Often when you're building it, the people who are actually providing that care or providing that technology or that resource could be the state government, it could be the municipal government, these different levels of bureaucracy. In this case, the, the transformation we're asking for is actually going to be done by the educators we're asking to lead the campaign. And it's going to impact the parents were asking to lead the campaign. We don't have the luxury in the early ed community to fully depend on the federal government or municipal government or state government to fix all the problems that early ed 
community has. We have too many facets of early ed that depend on the providers and the parents to make those changes. So we need the support of municipal, federal, and state government to be on, you know, be on this path of this be vision. On... I'm hearing reverb here. Is there an echo? Okay. Um, be on this path with us of transformation from the perspective of the parents and the providers. That's how we can have a successful long-term campaign that doesn't crumble. So we're very proud uh, to highlight our coalition partners. We have more than 30 partners already, 20 plus partners, almost close to uh, 60 members on our team that signed up uh, already attending seven months, <laughs> more than seven months of planning uh, to have these discussions. And we're extremely excited to grow from that. We are asking in this launch, uh, full involvement and participation of uh, other organizations and individuals who have not been part of the conversation. As we start going to legislative events in 2022, we start interacting uh, with other business leaders and make sure that we together create a vision for what early education looks like here in the state of Connecticut. There isn't a group or a person that isn't affected by this in our state. If you are an elderly person that has no grandkids, well, when it comes to taxes, you are impacted uh, by early education. When it comes to being a business leader, uh, you are impacted because you have employees who most likely have some need or capacity of education, early education and childcare in order to go to work. So we can't, we can't ignore any facet of this conversation, involvement is key. And if you're not part of that signing on team, I ask you uh, as an organizer, I have to make the ask. I ask you that you sign on. Um, if you're not ready to sign on and you need more information of what we're trying to build, um, please go to the launch, participate in the launch, uh, share our information. You should be hearing a lot more as we move forward uh, after November 3rd about what we're trying to accomplish and what the mission of this is. So I do hope that you'll will join us. I'll um, make sure I put the link to sign up for this event on the chat. And then that way you can spread the, the word with everyone. I'll take any questions if that's okay with the SDP team. Thank you, Eva. Uh, and thank you for putting that link into the chat. Uh, we will also follow up on this. We'll share the slides and the link and the, um, the slides, the link, and the recording with folks, but we hope to see you there at that um, event on the 3rd. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Steph. Really, really appreciate that you could join us today, Ava. Um, I do see that there might have been a few questions that came in, so we'll get to that. Uh, Tony, thrilled that you would like to join that um, coalition team. We'll definitely follow up. I know we must have your email if you signed up for this. But if you'd like to throw your email into the chat, um, just to me or just to Ava, that will be great as well. So let's see. Um, I'm just getting into the chat now because it was hard to do that while I was sharing my screen. But uh, Dorothy has asked a question about the supply side, the number of licensed providers that shut down during COVID. Are they reopening? This is a this is a great question, Dorothy. Um, Jen, I think that you have, do you have some of the latest information on that that you'd like to speak to? Um, Mary responded, though, I should say that all center-based programs in Norwalk that have closed have reopened. Many family child care programs haven't reopened. I know just specifically in, in Stanford, having a conversation with some folks last week that um, there are 13 programs that they know of in Stanford that haven't reopened. So the stabilization funds did help there. Um, but not all programs have gone back to um, previous uh, previous number. Jen, I'll turn it over to you. Scott, oh, oh. I was going to say 30%, 30%, but the breakdown, maybe Jen has more, so I'll, I'll leave it over to Jen. Um, probably not more. Um, if I was going to use the same number, I think like even nationally, it's about 70% um, open. And I think that when you look at um, 
Um, the, the supply, the other thing that you're seeing is that the capacity of open centers is significantly reduced because there is such a shortage of childcare providers as well. Um, and, it, and so anyway, um, Ava, I don't know if you want to add to that as well, or Mark too, I, I know you you have. Um, yeah. Mark. So, so for, for those who don't, don't know more about me, I represent, like, uh, like Sky mentioned, I represent home-based providers and through our, the numbers that OEC have, our, um, they show us in our reports and the numbers that are from our own interaction to home base, it looks like still it's hovering at 30% closure that haven't reopened. Um, in our own internal surveys of home base providers, it looks like unfortunately most of them won't be returning to the workforce. Uh, the, the pandemic has taken a toll so hard on them that reopening would mean that they would lose certain benefits that they gained by going back to uh, nine to five um, jobs with employers rather than going back to a reality where they're self-employed. Um, unfortunately, with uh, some of the centers, uh, the conversations we have some, with some centers that have closed, uh, it's, it's, again, the infrastructure money that came in is enough to get them going if they were still open, but it's not enough to reopen because then they, they know that they'll be right back in the, the, the crisis of not being able to pay their staff or using their own funding to pay their staff. So people are still waiting. Those who are closed, it seems that people are still waiting to see how many children that they can have in their care to reach that 90% capacity so that they're not back in a situation where they're running deficits. Thank you, Ava. I, I, Mark, uh, Mark Jaffe or um, Sarah Fabish, you might have something you know, to add about what you can see either Mark with your center or Sarah that you've seen in New Haven. Yeah, um, I, I don't necessarily have data on, uh, on other programs. I do know that uh, I do know that there are centers who are struggling to hire personnel, so that is a significant issue. I know that, um, and we've experienced, uh, although relative to the industry, we have a low rate of turnover um, in an industry that has a very high rate of turnover. Um, that notwithstanding, um, we have seen a, 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 a double. In, in our turnover rate, um, which is troubling. So we've been hiring um, and, um, and, and losing folks almost, almost as quickly. So um, that's, that's certainly a concern. Um, we also actually though have an issue of under enrollment. So, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that is you know, due to COVID concerns. Um, due to a lot of the parents of our families, of our children um, having lost their jobs, so they're likely home and keeping the children home. Um, that's beginning to change uh, in the last several weeks, but that's, um, that's a concern for us. And we're, we're, by the way, we're a large center-based program with locations in Stanford. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Um, Sarah, you look like you, you came off mute. Is there anything you can, you'd like to add? I mean, it's similar to that in New Haven, um, part of the Early Childhood Council. And one of the things we're struggling with is around capacity. And so we're at reduced capacity in a lot of the providers. Um, we're a school readiness community. Um, we could have more spaces, but um, programs have had to drop back because of the pandemic and, and spacing. Uh, but even if they were able to take more children, they don't have the staff. Uh, there is a real lack of um, uh, supply for, uh, for um, providers uh, that are educated and could take those spaces. And, you know, we have that double whammy where we have to have uh, someone in the classroom who has uh, credits and a degree. So um, that's one of the things that we're looking forward to the federal dollars because that the federal dollars are giving um, a potential capacity to uh, helping with the career pathways for early childhood providers. Um, but, uh, you know, are we geared up to do that? I mean, the other challenge is where the educational uh, community on that, both the community college and the state uh, 
colleges in terms of being able to offer the kind of education that allows people to get the accreditation. Really important aspect, Sarah, that we didn't we didn't touch on as as much because this is you know such a uh, a complex sector. I appreciate you bringing that up as well. Anyone anyone else? I'm just looking through the screens to see if there's any anyone else might want to have more input on that subject, or if you have any other questions that have have come up. Um, that could be about the ecosystem. It could also be about some of the projects as well that that we're working on that might be new to you or of interest to you. Hi, it also looks like Dorothy has asked a question about um, turnover rates. Oh, thank you. Um, and and I think that the the ranges, um, Dorothy, um, nationwide, you know, are anything from you know like a, a recent number I saw was estimating it to be as high as thirty to forty percent turnover in the field. Um, but as Mark pointed out. Um, you know, some you know strong centers have been able to um, keep those those numbers lower, but it's it's quite quite high. Thank you, Jen. Do we have any other any other questions or um, or projects? In the meantime, um, while you're thinking of questions, and I, Marjorie, are you still here? I can't see. You. There you are. Okay. Um, Marjorie, just if you'd like to introduce yourself, you know, particularly for SVP partners who are looking to get um, involved in a project or in any of our sector work. Thanks so much, Sky. I just thought, um, given the um, audience, it would be great if I could just take a minute to introduce myself. This is amazing work that you guys are all doing, and thank you so much for all of your hard work and effort that you've put into all of this. I know Mary and Jen and Sky and the rest of the team has done so much. So um, I am Marjorie Almancy. Um, there's a lot of faces that I don't know. I'm the director of human resources, um, recruitment and engagement. So it's my, in my job, I find partners who are interested in doing this work, um, talk to them about their skill set, their time and what they might be interested in getting involved with. And for example, Jen and Mary are both partners um, at SVP. So if anybody on this call is interested in getting involved with SVP, I would love to talk to you. I will put my email in the chat and just feel free to reach out to me and we can just have a conversation about um, what how you might want to get involved. So that's it. Thank you so much, Sky. I appreciate it. Sky obviously needs a lot of partners on these teams. So anybody who might be interested in getting involved in any of the teams that Sky is doing, this, this would be a great opportunity to do so. So yes. that's it. Yeah. Thanks, Sky. Thank you, Marjorie. We have a lot of um, really interesting and exciting opportunities um, to be engaged and you know I will just say that the workforce development work that SVP does for those who were on might have been on the governor's workforce council meeting which happened last Thursday uh, there was quite a bit of discussion about the challenges right now um, with workforce and with retaining staff and and hiring but one of the thing one of the items that was mentioned again and again is childcare and um, the challenges that employers are facing. And particularly, if you saw that slide um, for 30, I believe it's 34 to 39 year olds, um, the numbers have just decreased over the last two years significantly. So many, particularly women, are not in the workforce due to childcare. So it's right at the intersection of so much of the, the efforts that SVP is working on. Oh, Sarah had to leave. Thank you, Sarah. Um, let's see, there was one other question. Dorothy, don't, you're always great for questions. I appreciate your questions, so thank you for asking. Um, Dorothy asks, uh, the proportion of centers that are nonprofits versus for-profits and LLCs. Yeah, and actually just to elaborate, the, the reason I'm asking that is because I'm uh, in another state where I'm working with a client there being forced to set up a, a, a nonprofit, their uh, BIPOC business, led business, and they wanted to build wealth in their own LLC providing childcare, but now they've got to create a, a nonprofit arm because a grant funder has insisted it be going to a nonprofit. So I'm just wondering if, it, if in looking at the difference between those two, that there's some thought given to, are we forcing the, all of the entities to be 501c3s, 
when we might be missing out on a chance for building wealth in uh, some low income communities. All right, um, can I speak to that? Please. So, so currently there there is no system on the federal legislation that was that's that's being entered that requires uh, entities to become nonprofits or for profits that that a not a, a, a um, autonomy is being left for the provider themselves. Same here in the state of Connecticut. There, I haven't seen, we're not in session here in Connecticut, but I haven't seen any feedback from OEC or legislators requesting a change of how we how we currently do things. I can tell you from our, our coalition that we're gonna launch on November 3rd, that that has not been a conversation that anyone on the coalition has also discussed. Um, there, it's, it's literally been the opposite, like this intention that whatever public policy we do um, present to the legislature together will allow the, again, the autonomy of the individual, the child care provider, the business leader, the nonprofit, the for-profit to decide what mechanism of funding makes sense. It's more going to the angle of what uh, federal or state funding will be then funneled to that entity that already exists as an early educator. As for the breakdown currently in the state of Connecticut, OEC has shared the, the numbers with us and I, I wish I remembered off the top of my head like the 30%. Um, but what I could do is I can share with SB, SVP team and then that could be part of the package that they email to all of you of those kind of stats of the breakdowns of who's for profit, who's non profit, uh, who's open, who's not, because that's all been quantified by OEC and shared. Thank you, Ava. Um, one, one thing that um, is uh, really clearly a part of the federal um, legislation that is being considered and has been also um, clear in Connecticut is support of a mixed delivery system and the importance of that mixed delivery system which means um, that that whole list of providers that Matt Mary shared, you know, uh, family care providers, so out of homes, centers, and there are, you know, larger centers that might be like part of national companies. Uh, there are, you know, mid-sized centers, there are larger centers with only a, a few um, a few sites, but still, you know, large centers for Connecticut. But that mixed delivery system is really important, particularly to meet family needs. And that requires, you know, a lot of different supports. If you think about it, if you're running a business that is, you know, a, a family care provider, you're going to need different supports than, you know, a larger center-based provider and different um, considerations about training and quality and those kinds of considerations. So we're coming up at one o'clock right now. One thing I would love to do, Rob, oh, you just went off, off screen. So maybe this isn't a good time, but I would love to thank and acknowledge other you are, Rob Wexler as well, who is the other co-lead of the sector team along with Jen. And uh, thank you for all that you're doing. If you need research or something written, Rob is the person. He is re always ready to dig in and uh, figure that out for uh, so many of our projects. And we're really grateful for your leadership. Any last questions before we wrap up here at one o'clock? Okay, we will definitely be following up. We thank you so much for your time today. And again, Ava, Jen, and Mary for um, your presentations today. We look forward to continuing to you know, engage with our SVP partners and our other uh, partners in this early childhood space. And everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you.